Case Western Reserve University's Institute for the Science of Origins proudly presents the Origins Science Scholars Program. The Institute advances the scientific understanding and application of origins and evolution of human and natural systems. The Origins Science Scholars Lectures are presented with the assistance of Case Western Reserve University's Siegel Lifelong Learning Program, College of Arts and Sciences, and Media Vision. Tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Michael Hinchewski, who is the Warren E. Rupp Assistant Professor in the Department of Physics here at Case Western Reserve University. As Dr. Hinchewski writes, random fluctuations pervade cellular biology from the level of individual biochemical reactions to the intricate machinery responsible for transport and signaling. And yet, despite the noise at all scales, collective order emerges, a bewildering hierarchy of interconnected processes carefully arranged throughout the volume of the cell. Tonight, he will tell us where that order might come from as he talks about thermodynamics and the origin of life. Please join me in welcoming him. What I want to talk to today, in some ways, the entire topic of the talk uh, is a field of physics which uh, maybe a lot of people have not heard of because it's not quite always in the news. Um, it's known as non-equilibrium thermodynamics. Right? It has kind of an unwieldy name, but the questions it asks are in some ways some of the most fundamental questions we can ask about nature. Um, so in particular, uh, one of the central aspects of it is that physical systems tend to disorder. This is this thing, the famous concept of entropy, uh, which is famous in particular for being extremely confusing, uh, not just uh, to non-physicists, but to physicists themselves. And so what I'm going to try to do in this talk, in some ways the central theme of it, is to hopefully make that concept a little bit less confusing, or if that fails, at least confuse you in a way you haven't been confused before. Um, <laughs> So, any, I'm a, of course, I study biological things, right? So biological things are not entirely disordered. So one of the fascinating aspects of this topic is also, uh, despite the fact this tendency uh, toward disorder, why does complexity arise, right? And this leads into very interesting questions. Uh, people debate whether, you know, uh, how the second law is, you know, influences the origin of life. Um, so we're going to try to kind of uh, uh, disentangle some of the confusion um, in that area. Um, and in kind of most importantly, as you'll see, this is one of the themes of the later part of the talk, at what cost, right? So it's gonna, it's, we're going to show, and of course this is obvious because we exist, that indeed complexity does exist in nature, but it comes at an inherent cost, a thermodynamic cost which we'll, which we'll uh, explicate. Um, and kind of putting all these ideas together, what can they tell us about where, how life arose, right? Can they actually give us some clues as to the fundamental mechanisms, you know, four billion years ago where these, you know, living things uh, first arose, okay? Now these are all kind of extremely weighty questions, uh, very complex, you know, systems and topics, and we're gonna start somewhere seemingly completely ridiculously simple, right? But I think it's a, it's a nice illustration of some of the basic ideas. We're gonna play a game, okay? Um, this is, game is called Billiards. Um, on a Bunimovich Stadium, this is a shape uh, shown here on the left that's uh, named after a Russian mathematician and hence it kind of looks like a hockey stadium. Um, and the game is going to be simple. Uh, we're going to start with one particle initially and what I'm going to do is you're going to pay attention to the kind of position space. The particle is going to basically move in that position space, bounce off the walls, um, and it never loses velocity, right? The energy is always constant. And we're gonna keep track of its position here on the left, or yeah, on your left also, um, and the direction here on the right. Uh, so let's uh, show what one particle looks like. And you can see just bouncing off, and every time it bounces, the direction changes, okay? Now we're gonna play now the same game, but uh, we're gonna make 200 copies of that particle. Okay? Now these are not, these particles don't bounce off of each other, they don't interact. We're basically making 200 copies and all superimposing them on the same graph. And we're just gonna watch how they behave. Right? And the main difference is we're gonna put all the particles initially at the same spot, shown here, but we're gonna make their directions ever so slightly different, maybe plus or minus a, a degree uh, here. And then we're gonna watch how the system evolves in time. Right? So you can see the particles start kind of as a compact group, but every time they hit a curved surface, the groups begin to spread apart, uh, uh, and this continues, right? And we're gonna watch this for, for, for a few minutes. And what you can notice here, this is actually one of the most famous effects in dynamical systems, known as the butterfly effect. You may have heard this from you know, talks about chaos theory, where if you have a, this complex system, and this doesn't seem particularly complex, but it's complex enough, um, and you start it with slightly different initial conditions, and you watch it later on in time, 
it, 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 you know, those, those trajectories will eventually diverge quite dramatically. And the famous example of this is, you know, a butterfly flapping its wings in Hong Kong might end up, you know, weeks later with a hurricane uh, off the coast of Florida. Uh, whereas if it didn't flap its wings, that wouldn't have happened, right? That's kind of the popular uh, science version of this. But in general, it just means this kind of very sensitive dependence on initial conditions. And what you can see here is from that initial point where all the particles were in the same spot with more or less the same direction, in other words, kind of an ordered system, we're gonna, we'll define that a little bit more quantitatively later on, we go to a situation where all the particles are now spread uh, almost uniformly throughout the entire volume of, of the, the stadium, and almost all direct possible directions are uniformly exhibited, okay? Um, so this is gonna be uh, uh, crucial, but we wanna kind of somehow quantify this, right? Put this into, give it a number, right? So this is kind of this, this going from an ordered to a disordered way, can we actually translate that into like a quantity, right? So to do that, we're gonna add one more element to our game. Right? We're gonna create a, a, basically a grid of addresses. Think of this almost like regions on a map. You, know, you have uh, uh, demarcating longitude and latitude, but here we're gonna have some addresses denoting position uh, on the left and some addresses denoting uh, uh, direction on the right. Now if here I've just divided everything into six sections for simplicity. I could do this into a million sections, right? The, this, the, the same concept still, still applies. Um, and at each time, uh, in, while we're looking at the system, we can be at a particular, or the system is going to be a particular address. So for example, here, uh, the system at, at, the, at the initial time is in address 1D, right? Because it's in region 1, uh, position, uh, direction, uh, region D. Um, and at some later time, it's going to be in some address which we'll call XY. Right? Um, but there's always going to be some address in which the system is at at all times. And in order to basically quantify this a little bit better, we're going to now, uh, we're considering this ensemble, this 200 copies of the system. So we're going to basically define the fractions of, the sys of, of that ensemble that are in particular addresses at particular times. Right? So we're going to say the probability to be at a certain address x, y at time t, right, is this basically going to be the fraction of all those systems at that address. All right? Um, now this is going somewhere, it's not just uh, mathematics for, for mathematics sake, um, because once we have that probability, uh, we're gonna, this is the final step, uh, we're gonna use it to calculate a number, right? And that's, so I'm gonna show, there's gonna be a few equations in the talk, I apologize. Um, understanding it hopefully won't be based on, you know, uh, you don't need to follow the equations uh, too deeply, but this equation I really wanted to show because in some ways I'm gonna argue it's one of the most beautiful equations in physics. Um, and so what we've done here is we've taken that probability, um, we've summed, we've multiplied it by the logarithm of itself and summed over all the addresses. We multiply it by some unimportant constant out in front, and that's the thing we call entropy, this mystical, important quantity in physics. That's it, that's all it is. It's just this looking at a system, dividing it up into addresses, calculating probabilities, getting a number out of it. And what we'll show later is that as a concept, this is incredibly versatile because these addresses here are position and direction addresses, but they could be anything. In fact, they could be chemical states, and we'll, we'll show examples of that later. Uh, the originator of this equation, the first, the first one to write it down, um, is J.W. Gibbs. Um, he was, uh, someone called Einstein called him the greatest mind in American history. Um, that might be, I'm not qualified to, to say that uh, 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 directly, he definitely arguably is, is among the or the greatest physicists in American history. Um, part of the beauty of, of, this, of, this, of his work on thermodynamics in general, and this equation in particular, is it has such a long afterlife. So 50 years roughly after he wrote it down, Claude Shannon came across the same equation in information theory and more or less laid the foundations of our modern, modern understanding of how information is processed in computer systems, right? So this is an equation with an extremely many, many different um, uh, applications. But for us, it's a number, a positive number, and it's gonna have a very simple kind of interpretation, right? So if all of our system is in one position on the map, so in one region on the map, our entropy is zero, okay? As, as, that, as the ensemble kind of, uh, uh, kind of covers more and more uh, different regions. So we're gonna color those with different shadings of, of, of orange. Um, entropy grows. So initially entropy was zero. Here now it's spread out a little bit, so entropy has grown to about 1.9 in this unit of K. Um, here it's now almost uniformly spread throughout both in position and direction space. It's reached about 3.4, okay? So think of it as just a measure of how much this probability spreads out. And we're gonna now watch that same movie 
that we saw before, that ensemble kind of diverging because of this butterfly effect, but now we're gonna keep track of that number um, as we're watching that. So this is what it looks like. So it's diverging initially, probability is more or less confined in, in, in a few regions, our entropy is small, and then as, it in, as time progresses, entropy increases. Now it's a bit noisy here because we only did 200 copies. So if we had done this like a million times, a million copies, we'd actually, we'd actually just see a smooth increasing curve. And as it increases, it begins to kind of saturate and almost reach a maximum. Um, and that maximum is also going to be important because that maximum essentially is the place where the probability is more or less uniformly distributed both in position and direction space. So I'm not gonna wait until it completely reaches it, but um, this is what it looks like uh, after you run it for a long time. Um, and that maximum is then the second, like, like three equations in the talk, this is the second equation. Uh, again, one of the most uh, fundamental equations uh, in physics, uh, which is that maximum of entropy that it reaches um, is just K times the log of W. And W, all it is is just the number of addresses in our map. So we had six position addresses, six direction addresses, so altogether 36 combinations. Um, so it's just a log of 36, which is about 3.4. Um, that's it. Now this equation is so important that Boltzmann, um, or rather uh, Boltzmann's uh, probably immediate family or, or supporters, had it carved into his gravestone. So it is literally uh, a, an equ a physics equation carved in, in stone. Um, and it's probably the most famous version of entropy that, that, that people are familiar with. But keep in mind that it only applies at really long times, right? Once the system has basically uniformly distributed itself around um, all of position and direction space, and that's what we call equilibrium. Um, but what I'm gonna argue throughout the rest of the talk is somehow this initial part where entropy is rising is also incredibly important. And in some sense, the Gibbs version, which gives us the entropy throughout, um, is the more fundamental thing to look at. Um, okay, so at this stage, we can kind of summarize what this has, you know, this is what this little game has shown us by, you know, making a law, right? So this is, this is our version of the second law of thermodynamics, which says that for an isolated system, so a system that does not interact with the environment, like our little Bunimovic Stadium billiards game, entropy increases over time until it reaches this maximum, uh, given by the Boltzmann equation. All right, um, and it's a law, right? So you should definitely, definitely believe it, uh, you know. Uh, and this is how I, I, as an undergraduate, always took it. People brought me laws, especially if they're carved, in, they're literally carved in stone, right? Um, you, you just, you know, you take it as a given. This is a law of nature. Um, so is this in, true, in fact universally true? So I'm gonna show you next will perhaps shock you. Um, I will violate the second law of thermodynamics right in front of your eyes, um, and I'm going to do this by just a very, very small change to our game, right? We had our Russian hockey stadium with curved edges. I'm gonna make them straight, all right? So more like a tennis court. Um, and let's see what happens. So here's the same game played in a rectangle, all right? Now you can see the, the, the group of trajectories here, we started with slightly different initial conditions, is kind of spreading out, but definitely not as much as before, and in particular, look at direction space on the right. Direction space, you see that it's not spreading out at all. It's only really visiting four corners of that direction graph. Our entropy is increasing a little bit, but not so much. And in fact, if you run this forever, it will never ever reach the Boltzmann equation. So that, that thing carved in stone is clearly not universally true. Um, if you keep on running this a uh, long time, it's gonna kind of look like a 1980s screensaver. Um, it's kind of mesmerizing. Um, but it's surely not this kind of spreading out in all of position space that we saw before, where it kind of almost looked like a gas, right? Spreading out through, through a volume. Here it's, it's much more ordered, right? And that's clearly reflected by the fact that our entropy is, is much smaller, all right? So I think we're gonna need a revision on our law. Um, you know, terms and conditions uh, may apply. Uh, and in fact, this is actually a subtle and, and, and difficult problem because uh, this is, uh, well, a, you know, from the mathematic, mathematician's standpoint, this is enough to show that like, clearly this is not a universal law, um, but can it be shown uh, for any systems? Um, so uh, it turns out that the, the only place where this law has been rigorously proven is for these kind of simple mathematical games like billiards. 
Um, and uh, Yaakov Sinai, who was the first person to actually prove this for, for a billiards uh, system, actually won what's the equivalent of like a Nobel Prize in math, the, the 2014 Abel Prize for this proof. It's ridiculously hard. And that's for like one particle bouncing around. Um, it becomes even more uh, difficult. Like it's not even been proven for a group of balls bouncing off of each other um, in a simple two-dimensional surface. Um, so it's quite a difficult thing. What do you mean by an isolated system? So in this particular case, I mean a system that doesn't exchange energy or particles with its surroundings, mm -hmm. right? So this is, I mean, later on we'll consider systems like biological systems where we're clearly sitting here, you know, this room is a certain temperature, we're constantly exchanging energy. Particles in the, in the gas uh, around us are bouncing off of us, um, giving us and taking energy away from us. Um, so that's a more complicated scenario. So in this particular case, I mean a system that has no exchange of energy or particles or anything else with its surroundings. For both of those shapes, uh, does the uh, size of the shape matter? In other words, if, it was, if the stadium was round or if it was higher and wider or and the square, if it was higher and wider, does that the, have anything to do with absolute this? Shape, the absolute size of the shape doesn't, doesn't matter, except that like, um, it does, uh, circles are a bit different. So it, and it does have to have this combination of straight and curved edges. Um, but the actual dimensions of the shape don't matter too much. It'll matter in terms of how, how long it may take to equilibrate, but beyond that, it's the second law will hold for the curved, for the curved stadium, yeah. Be, you know, again, in the shape of the arena, for example, when you have a curved one and you've got objects ricocheting off of a curve, they have you know a, a bigger range of direction they can travel in when you hit a straight line or a flat surface. The angle of incidence equals the angle of deflection. Yeah, so that's actually, you bring up a very interesting point because um, it turns out that in this particular shape, the way the dynamics are, are designed, the angle of incidence always does equal the angle of reflection, but you have to define the angle as kind of the tangent to the circle when you're doing the, when you're doing the kind of curved circular part. So it's basically the line that just touches, that just grazes uh, the edge of the circle, and then it bounces off of, of that line. But what you bring up, that, which, is a, which actually is true, is that the behavior of curved surfaces is much different than behavior of straight lines. And that's why in the rectangular case, you get much less divergence. So a little extra kind of, uh, um, you know, the slight mathematical difference there is enough to create this divergence. Um, but it's actually a really, it's a really subtle point, and it's not something that like you can, well, I'm going to actually, I'm going to say you can't generalize it, but I'm going to literally just do that in the next slide. But um, <laughs> uh, it's very difficult to prove rigorously. Um, and that's why it's kind of, you know, I mean, Yaakov Sinai was one of these mathematicians who sat in the back of physics lectures and looked at what the physicists were saying and thought, like, this is just ridiculous. They're making so many assumptions. Let me go back to first principles and prove it. And then it took him like a career to prove one simple thing. What if the arena were shaped, uh, say, like a hexagon or a pentagon? I think uh, from, from poly, I have to double check this. I believe that any combination of straight edges would not give you chaos. Um, but I would have to double check that. I haven't seen this game played in, in, in like polygons. But I think it's, you, re, you do need to have these curved surfaces uh, for this to work. Thank you for joining us. You've been watching Professor Mike Kinchevsky introducing the basic concepts of non-equilibrium thermodynamics. For more information on the Origin Science Scholars Program, please visit the Institute's website at origins.case.edu. In the next part of the talk, Professor Inchevsky will discuss entropy and the chemistry underlying life. Now, back to the talk. There is clearly something called the second law of thermodynamics, which we learn about in textbooks and, we, and, and uh, which, uh, which does exist. Um, but in some ways, it's kind of a leap of faith, right? So what, what I want to kind of emphasize is, yes, we look at these shapes of, of the surfaces, but what really was the distinguished thing was one led to this kind of chaotic dynamics, which was highly dependent on initial conditions. The other didn't. Right? And we believe, again, this very, very rough rule of thumb that systems, complicated systems, meaning systems with lots and lots of particles, like all of us and, and the universe around us, with strong interactions where particles bouncing off, interacting with each other with, through fundamental physical forces, though that system take, taken in aggregate is indeed a chaotic system. And we, of course, we know that for things like weather systems, we see chaos, chaos all the time. And in particular, we think the entire universe, observable universe, falls in this category, all right? And this is why we can talk about, at least as a, as a kind of leap of faith, a second law for the universe, even though we can't rigorously mathematically prove it. 
Um, now, one thing I wanted to do as an aside, and this is, again, I, I apologize to actual cosmologists in the audience. People love to talk about the entropy of the universe. Um, what actually is it, and what does it look like? Um, so this is the best estimate that I could find, but it's going to, it looks like that. Um, this is based on a paper from Egan and Lineweaver uh, published a few years ago. What I want to convince you, of, it's a little bit different than our line, you know, entropy increasing over time um, uh, in, the, in the stadium, but still same pattern. Things increase over time. So this is, the time scale is a little bit different. You can notice this is like 10 to the minus 40, 10 to the minus 21, 10 to the 20. We're about 10 to the 17 seconds uh, since the Big Bang. Um, but overall, that entropy has increased by, by fairly large, you know, uh, it kind of stays constant for a while and then has these huge increases over time. And we're right about here, kind of on this final plateau before an extrapolated value um, where eventually the universe will end up in heat death um, and perfect equilibrium, right? That's the maximum uh, over there. We're not there yet. We still have some time to go, happily. Um, now, what's really interesting about, I'm not going to talk about all the, what causes all these in individual bumps. Just kind of an aside, what's really interesting is if you had to guess what contributes the most to the entropy of the universe um, uh, in the current moment, it's actually quite interesting. Um, so here's our entropy. It's 10 to the 104 in these units of, of K. Um, and these are the contributions. So, Supermassive black holes. So these are the black holes that are like can be billions of times the mass of our sun. 99.9999 percent. Okay, um, a lot. Okay. Uh, what else contributes to the entropy? Oh, there's also smaller black holes. Those are in there, about 0 0.0001 percent. Um, and there's a bunch of other things. Photons. You got to add a bunch of zeros. Um, and then you can, there's a whole list in this, in this paper, and eventually you'll get down to ordinary matter, including all of us in the audience here, um, and the rest of the stars and uh, other, other matter in the universe, and that's our fraction of the total entropy. Um, in a weird way, and again, something that I'm not, this is not the topic of this course, uh, black holes dominate the entropy budget of the universe to a ridiculous extent. Um, uh, in fact, that recent black hole that you all saw in the news, that famous the black hole picture, that's about 10 to the 95k in entropy, if you based on its uh, uh, you know extrapolated parameters, um, that has 100 trillion times more entropy. In other words, 100 trillion times more addresses living on the surface of that black hole than all the ordinary of the ma uh, matter in the universe put together. Okay, so one way of looking at kind of the issue of complexity in terms of the entropy, this you know second law says the entropy of the universe must always increase, is in some sense what we, all of us here um, are highly, highly irrelevant to the overall entropy budget of the universe. <laughs> um, that cannot be said enough. I mean, in some sense, the fact that you have these stars burning for a few you know billion years, and you have some rocky you know uh, planets circling those stars, and some chemical processes happening on those on those planets that lead to some kind of self-aware you know uh, uh, life. I mean, that's kind of like froth on a giant ocean, um, where the vast majority, the bulk of that ocean, um, is living. On on the surface of black holes. Um, so in some sense, what's happening with black holes dominates the entropy budget, and everything else is kind of like, you know, you can't even call it a rounding error, because this is like so, such a tiny, tiny fraction of it. Now, that's not quite the end of the story, right? Because in that sense, then we could say, well, anything goes, because, you know, at some level, like our, our, the fact that we, have, we lower our entropy state a little bit here, it doesn't really matter that much in terms of a universal entropy budget, but it's not quite that, right? Because in some sense, the second law doesn't just apply to the universe as a whole, it also applies to subsystems of the universe. And that's where we pay kind of the, the, the dues to the second law in everything that we do. Um, all right, so how, do we, how, does, how does the second law play out on smaller scales? So that was the, that was the end of our co cosmology aside. Um, to understand this kind of, you know, its implications on our scale, um, let's take a look at some snapshots. So we're going to go back to our game, um, and now we're going to look at, let's say, the first 20 seconds. Okay, so we're going to look at that movie again, first 20 seconds of it, while the entropy is increasing. Um, let's watch. All right, so the thing kind of diverges, and then the movie will stop. All right, I'm going to show you a second version of that, and you can just shout out what you think is going on. So this is a second version of that. It's converging. What have I done? I'm playing, OK, yes. Obviously, it seems like I'm playing backwards. The answer is no. <laughs> Um, I'm almost doing that, and in fact, I'm getting the same result. What I've actually done is I've started in this configuration here, 
That was the, the, the configuration at 20 seconds. And all I've done is I reversed all the velocities. So I basically, these were the old velocities here in pink. I've now just moved them across to the other side of the circle um, and just you know, or, or, or rearranged all the directions. And when you do that, um, everything just converges back to the beginning. It seems like it's going backwards in time, right? To us, psychologically, that's what, what uh, seems to be happening. Um, and in fact, this is actually true that for any physical system, you can actually reverse things, right? So uh, people have actually, just a few days ago, there was in the news that people have managed to do this for several qubits. They more or less were able to have qubits evolve in time for a certain amount of time, do some complicated quantum mechanical manipulations, and those qubits, those little quantum particles, uh, would then evolve backwards, kind of, they call them Benjamin Button uh, you know, qubits. Now, why did you think it was going backwards in time? Because to us, you know, our experience of the world, we know that there's a certain sequence of things that are more likely to happen versus than other. For example, we know that little babies grow up to be teenagers, grow up to be middle-aged people, grow up to eventually, you know, be older, and then eventually we die. That's we see that all the time. We we rarely see, except in movies with Brad Pitt, you know, old people becoming infants, you know, and reverting back. Now it turns out that there's nothing inherently violating the laws of physics of having a Benjamin Button, um, it's just highly, highly unlikely. Um, and this is one of the things that uh, we, that kind of a, a consequence that I'm gonna to try to emphasize about entropy increasing is that it means when entropy is increasing, certain sequences of events are much more likely to happen than others. So for example, that sequence when the, when the balls kind of diverge and bounce and become more disordered, that you, seems much more likely to you to occur than a sequence where everything converges. Even though it's possible to have all those velocities flipped and everything to go back to its initial part. It's just really, really hard to do that. And the more particles you have, the more statistically difficult it is to flip everything and have everything converge back to itself. Right? So when entropy increases, there seems to be a preferred order of, of, of things. Right? Um, and we'll make that a quantitative uh, in a little bit. Now I want to show you now just a contrast, a second snapshot, which is at the very end of the simulation when we're looking near equilibrium. All right? So this is going to be, I'm going to do the same game. So I'm going to play it for 20 seconds uh, like that, and then, okay, it's bouncing around like a, like a gas. I'm gonna do the same thing, flip all the velocities, play it again, and there, if you look at it, you won't be able to tell which one, if I just showed you without telling you the difference, there's no way you can actually even tell statistically which one is going forwards, which one is going backwards. In fact, every sequence of events when we've reached our maximum when entropy no longer changes is e as equally likely as any other. There's no preferred direction. So in a very real sense, in equilibrium, there is no arrow of time. Right? This is the famous, if you, you may have heard of it in, 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 um, uh, in discussions of this topic, but this is, uh, this is what it boils down to. Right? We don't see that arrow of time in an equilibrium system when entropy is not increasing. Okay. So let's make this a little quantitative. So this is kind of, I'm going to give you a little bit of flavor of some of the ways we think about entropy now, kind of a modern uh, physics context. We can actually do this, play this game in terms of addresses. So we have one take, which is we have a system that visits you know, four addresses um, as it's evolving in time. We can ask, take two, the system visits those ad same addresses, but in reverse order. And we can play this, you know, we can run the simulations many times. We can ask, how often does that occur versus take, take one occur versus take two? Um, and we can calculate the probabilities of those, of those sequences. If we take the ratio of them and then take the log of it, um, we get a number, which I'm going to call sigma. Um, this sigma is actually, in some ways, our modern, the modern version of what Gibbs was doing. We actually now interpret that as essentially being an entropy of a sequence. So before I was talking about an entropy of an ensemble of many copies of a system. Um, here we're actually defining entropy at the level of a sequence of states which we visit. Um, and we, we interpret that as basically the amount by which the entropy of the universe has increased during that visiting the forward sequence of states. So if the entropy is not increasing, right, the probability of the top is the same as the bottom, that's one, right? The ratio is one, the log of one is zero, so entropy is not increased, that's consistent. And if one is much, much larger, much, much smaller than the other, then entropy is either large, very much increasing or decreasing during the sequence. So let me give you a concrete example of this. Um, Humpty Dumpty, right? Everybody knows Humpty. This is a sequence of two events. Humpty is intact, Humpty falls, breaks. Um, and according to the nursery rhyme, uh, all the king's horses and all the king's men could not put Humpty back together again. Um, but they, you know, Humpty could have spontaneously reassembled. Um, again, not, not violating the laws of physics, highly, highly unlikely. But we can calculate the ratio. So Humpty falling, Humpty breaking versus Humpty reassembling. That number is like 10 to the 10 to the 20. That's a very, very large number. Um, 
And how does that, you know, by converting it to entropy in the, in, using the formula from the previous slide, that corresponds about, about 10 to the 20K uh, re, of entropy released into the universe. So the universe has crept up that much closer towards heat death by Humpty falling. Um, now here's the, then the crucial uh, uh, part for the next uh, several you know, slides of the talk. That's fine. So that's kind of, and this is this, is this law, this, this idea that I've shown you applies just as well for Humpty's as subsystems, the so living things. You know, it doesn't, it's a law that applies to subsystems as well as the whole universe. But how does the entropy of the universe increase when Humpty falls? Um, and it turns out that this increase is just heat release, right? Um, it's about 0.2 calories, so not a huge amount of heat, but that's, uh, oh, are we, okay. Um, yeah, so uh, it's not a huge amount of, of heat release, but it's some amount of, of heat has been released into, into, the, uh, into the surroundings. And why does the universal entropy kind of increase there? Because when we add, give energy to the surroundings, the surroundings in some ways can explore more addresses, um, and hence the entropy of the universe as a whole uh, is increasing. Right? So, uh, so that's going to be kind of crucial, because this is how typically we pay our due to entropy as you know, subsystems of the universe, we tend to release uh, heat, uh, dissipate heat, right? Okay, so uh, let me give you a kind of a more down-to-earth example of this, um, uh, where we are releasing heat. So this is a circuit, right? We attach a battery to a circuit um, and you know, a motor to that, to that circuit, there's some uh, 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 heat being dissipated. Uh, now, what's going on here? Right? Why doesn't there need to be heat dissipated? Well, the electrons in that wire, if we didn't have the battery attached, would just be more or less uh, moving in random directions. Right? There would be no preferred direction. So one, one kind of sequence of electrons motion to the left would be equally probable to another sequence of electron motions to the right. Um, but in when we have a current flowing through the system, uh, one of those sequences becomes much more likely than the other. Right? There's a preferred direction for the electrons to move through our wire. Um, based on the argument that I just showed you, because there's now this preferred sequence of states which the system visits, the entropy of the universe must increase. Um, how does it increase? Well, heat has to be dissipated, all right? Um, okay, heat is a form of energy. It's being released into the environment. Where does that energy come from? There must be an energy source, right? That's why we have to have a battery. So in a weird way, in this kind of inverted thermodynamic uh, perspective, I argue the existence of the battery by the fact that first there's a symmetry breaking in the motion of the electrons. Um, but for me, that heat, that th we, we take it for granted, you know, we plug things in, you know, our electronics are, are all heated up, things like that. That, that, that. that kind of very mundane aspect of our daily lives is in fact the dues are all the objects around us are paying to the second law of thermodynamics. So this heat dissipation is essentially the entropy price because those electrons are moving uh, in a preferred direction. Um, because there's this other law of thermodynamics, which I have not emphasized, called the first law, but more, more or less the energy conservation, the heat, the power in minus the power out is equal to the power dissipated, right? So you have to have more power in than power out um, in order to have dissipated heat, right? So you have to have an energy source that's larger than the power that the motor is, is using. Um, all right, this is a, a more, much more concise way of, of explaining this. Um, this is stupid. Don't do this. Um, uh, those electrons in that wire are not going to spontaneously begin going, moving around um, uh, in a circle uh, because there's no uh, uh, power source. OK. So uh, now, let's now switch gears a little bit. So everything that I've talked so far have been addresses that have lived uh, basically positions and directions, positions and directions of electrons um, or particles and stadium. The power of this concept is that address could be anything. It could be a chemical, it could be a step in a chemical cycle. So this is a, one of these famous cycles that if you have memories of high school biology, it probably brings you back some nightmares of memorization. Uh, we're not gonna go through the details uh, of these kind of metabolic cycles, but note that whenever they, the people draw these cycles, always the arrows primarily in one direction. Why? Because in, in that's how it happens in our bodies. It primarily goes in one direction rather than the other. Um, what does that mean? It means that we have now a sequence of states more likely to go in one direction than the other. Well, we gotta pay our due to the second law. That means heat has to be dissipated. Right? So there's, there's going to be some necessary entropic price uh, to pay. Um, 
So let me give you uh, kind of one, one very famous example of such a, of such a cycle. Um, so this is the ATP synthase protein. So this is a protein that essentially uh, uh, synthesizes this energy molecule called ATP, which then runs a lot of the other biological processes in our body. And those biological processes degrade that energy molecule back into ADP um, and phosphate. Um, and this protein actually spins around. It's kind of this interesting rotor uh, complex. And it spins around primarily in one direction, so long as you have an imbalance of ions on one side of a membrane uh, versus the other. In that previous uh, work where you were bouncing the particles uh -huh. around the racetrack, uh, just as a, as a problem, I would ask what would happen if it, the racetrack was elliptical and you started out at one focus of the ellipse? I don't think there would be chaos. Um, I have not explored all, uh, all possible shapes, but I, I do think if, if ellipses were, uh, I would have heard about it <laughs> in some ways. Like it requires a particular combinations of shapes. Um, a, ray of light that, a ray of light that goes through one focus will wind up at the other focus. Yeah, so, so that would argue against the fact that things are going to become disordered in, inside that ellipse. Yeah, um, but I think, I think it, would, it would, not, would not become disordered in the same way. I may have missed this. Uh -huh. <coughs> Excuse me. What is the actual definition of the word entropy? Okay, so used in this talk, um, and I want to be kind of very clear so that there isn't this confusion. The definition of entropy is this thing here in the blue box. So um, you take a system, uh, you divide it up into a state space, some you know, addresses which just denote the states of the system. You have probabilities associated with being at a particular address at a certain time. You take those probabilities, you multiply them by the logarithm, you add them all up. That's entropy. Um, Could you give me a sentence? A sen OK. So, <laughs> so the less mathematical uh, uh, definition would be, it would be a measure of how, dis how spread out that probability is, how disordered the system is. How, spread, how, disor how disordered the problem is. How, dis how spread out the probability is, which you can interpret in a way as how disordered the system is. Because the more spread out you are, the more addresses you live in, the more different combinations are possible that you see in the, in, in, in the system. So when entropy is zero, everything lives at one address. When entropy is large, everything is, all addresses are equally likely to, uh, to occur. And there's a, there's a roof to how far, how high. Exactly, right? So think about it like if this was a completely empty city and all of us sitting here in the audience were in this particular room, and let's say we divided up the city into boxes of the, of the side of this room, the entropy of our, of our population would be zero. But then if you guys all went out and equally, like uniformly spread out throughout all of the Cleveland area, um, so that there was a uniform population density of, of you everywhere, then your entropy would be maximum. That would be the, the most disordered that you could become. And it's different for different systems. It's completely different for different systems. Even, even the notion of what an address is is different. That's why I kind of use this word address. I mean, in physics, we call it phase space, but that's more technical. But like, what I'm claiming is that this idea of addresses works just as well in chemistry as it does for, for actual physical positions. We hope you've been enjoying the Origin Science Scholars Program with Professor Michael Hinchevsky. Professor Hinchevsky is the Warren E. Rupp Assistant Professor in the Department of Physics at Case Western Reserve University, specializing in theoretical biophysics. In the second part of our talk, we learned how life is a cascade of energy conversion and dissipation. In our final segment, Professor Inchevsky will talk about thermodynamics and the origin of life. Now, back to our talk. So if you take a, you know, again, comparing or going back to this comparison with the battery, it seems like a very, very different system, right? So we have, but I'm going to argue it's not that much different, right? Um, so on one hand, we have a system that's kind of has some preferred direction, right? Um, here it's the mode, it's the proteins, you know, prefer, preferably going in one direction. Um, here it was the electrons preferably going in one direction around the wire. We have some process that's going on where energy is being utilized. Here it's the synthesis of ATP, here it's the motor. Uh, 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 turning, um, we have some power source. Here it's a battery, some, it's, it's essentially a chemical potential energy. Here that battery is in some sense the imbalance of ions on one side of the membrane versus the other. And as a necessary consequence of the second law of thermodynamics, heat has to be released. There has to be some amount of loss of energy through heat. Now if you let both of these systems run indefinitely, what would happen? Well, your battery would become depleted, 
it would go to equilibrium, right? The electrons would stop moving in a preferred direction. Here, if you kept on running this thing forever, eventually this, there would be the equal number of ions on one side of the membrane versus the other, and now your protein would begin to you know, have, it would still kind of move, uh, but in random ways and not with a preferred direction. Uh, so you're basically your battery would become depleted. So what happens in, in nature is, well, in our case, we sometimes we switch out the batteries. Maybe it's a rechargeable battery. We can recharge it. In nature, we pump out, we pump those ions continuously back out, right? How that pumping occurs differs from organism to organism, um, and it's in, in our case, it's we ingest food, and that some of that energy is being converted into pumping out those uh, those ions. Um, let me give you one kind of uh, very simple example. This is from a, a simple uh, 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 bacterium, um, where that pumping occurs because of another protein called bacteriorhodopsin on the membrane, and it basically it interacts with photons from sunlight and uses that energy from the photons to basically drive its own cycle of pumping, where it pumps those ions back out. Uh, on the other side of the membrane, then you have an imbalance form. That imbalance then is used to power this ATP synthase to basically produce the ATP, then that drives other biological processes, right? And this is one particular example, but in some ways, everything that we know about life is kind of built on kind of these nested cycles, right? So I'm gonna kind of draw it like this, right? So you might have some fundamental energy source on top. In this case, it was a photon. That energy source powered a cycle which created a certain imbalance. Um, in this case, it was an ion gradient, so more ions on one side of the membrane to the other. That ion gradient, that imbalance, in turn then powered a different imbalance, right? Another cycle primarily in one direction of the ATP synthase protein, um, which then in turn powers other cycles drive, driven primarily in one direction, all of our metabolic cycles and cell division, things like this. At every step, because we are driving things primarily in one direction, so we're breaking the symmetry, we have to pay our dues to the second law. So we have to dissipate energy. We have to, there has to be some heat released at every single step of the process. So note that because of energy conservation, that means the energy available to all the lower tiers becomes progressively lower and lower and lower. We're wasting energy all, th all throughout. But that waste is not somehow a bad thing, it's what makes us living, right? Because without that waste, there wouldn't be this broken symmetry. We wouldn't have our cycles going around primarily in one direction. Um, so, um, in fact, you sitting here, uh, all of us, are releasing about 100 watts of power, um, which is the old, um, this is not an audience where I have to remind people of what incandescent light bulbs are, um, but to my students, I may have to do that. <laughs> um, but I mean, I, you know, it's about, about a, the power of an old, old fashioned, now old fashioned light bulb. Um, so that 100 watts of power we're releasing into the, the atmosphere, that is in some sense the indicator of all the non-equilibrium thermodynamic processes going on inside of our bodies. All the biochemical cycles being, being primarily driven in one direction. The net result of that is this 100 watts that we're, that we're releasing out into the, uh, into the atmosphere. All right. So, that was one thing, one particular organism. Um, how, do, how does it happen for others? Well, it turns out that from this kind of cascade, there are two parts that are really universal to all known life um, that we see around us. One is the ion gradient of some kind. The other is ATP as this energy molecule, as this currency. What drives the ion gradient is now, in, in modern living organisms, is not universal anymore, right? Some, in some cases here it was a photon. In us it's ingesting of other, of, of other material. For bacteria living you know, near you know, hydrothermal vents at the bottom of the ocean might be some chemical uh, 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 sources which, which, which drive this. So that becomes that first step in the top part of the cascade is no longer universal. And of course the things that we do with ATP differ from, from different organisms, right? So that, that's no longer universal. Um, but in some sense, if we're trying to think of this as these nested chemical cycles where one thing, you know, one imbalance drives another, dissipating heat along the way, um, ultimately speaking, tracing this evolutionary history back to the beginning of time, there had to be some fundamental original imbalance that drove the first, you know, glimmers, the first, you know, echoes of these, of these kind of cycles forward, right? Um, where things were driven out of an equilibrium state to primarily go into one, one, one direction. Um, and on Earth, it, it turns out that if you do this kind of detective work, going forensically, going back in time, everything that we see around us that's interesting in some sense, all things that, bio, that are not in equilibrium, so air currents, ocean currents, plate tectonics, all the chemical cycles in life, and I, it's, I, like I'm trying to argue that mathematically we can lump all of these things together as being different things, you know, different versions of, you know, the symmetry is broken, right? things are going around in currents. Um, all of these have to be traced back 
to two fundamental imbalances. Um, uh, and those are the fact that we have, you know, we're sitting next to a star which is bombarding us with photons, beautiful source, though transient, um, uh, on a scale of billions of years uh, of, of energy that can drive imbalances. The other is geological. The fact that uh, the, the, there's heat released as the, inner, as the core of the Earth kind of solidifies. There are radioactive elements in the mantle that are decaying, which provides um, uh, heat. So the kind of geo, geological and solar are really our two, two sources. And unsurprisingly, there are two major camps in the origins of life field, right? People who think that maybe life emerged in kind of like you know shallow surface uh, lakes exposed to sunlight, um, people who, or people who think that maybe life emerged in, in deep ocean hydrothermal events, right? Where we kind of have this clear division between these two imbalances. Then of course there could be combinations of the two. You can have shallow surface lakes at Yellowstone or Yellowstone-like things where there are some kind of you know geothermal aspects to it as well. But the kind of the, the field kind of breaks into two camps. Um, and can we use thermodynamics in some sense to kind of maybe give an edge to one camp versus the other? Um, and again, I'm not going to say anything definitive, so uh, you know, this is still an ongoing question, and there are mechanisms by which both, both origins might, might work. Um, but this is actually, so this is a kind of complicated graph, but let me, let me walk you through it. Um, on the horizontal axis, think of this as energy, okay? And this is energy now measured here in terms of units of milli electron volts. It doesn't really uh, uh, matter what the units are, but from low to high. Um, and here we also see the corresponding energies of photons, right? Where visible photons, the light from the visible spectrum part of light is about this range of energies. Um, above that is the so called ultraviolet part of, of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, here in this green range are energies typically associated with uh, biochemical processes, like, for example, ATP hydrolysis, things like this. This is membrane potential energy. So they, they live in this kind of infrared range of, of the spectrum. On the bottom of this graph, are ranges of energies available from certain sources. So here in blue is water heated up to its critical temperature, beyond which it doesn't, it's no longer liquid in some sense. Here is like the energies available from like lava, like molten rock um, uh, at really high temperatures. This uh, orange curve is the energy available from uh, the sun, the solar spectrum. Um, and out here at really much higher things are, are, are basically intermittent strikes of lightning. Right? Now, if we think about this kind of range of sources, you can say, well, look, molten rock, water temperatures, high water temperatures, they do kind of give us, give us within the, get us within the ballpark of what we see as biochemical energies. Right? But then if we consider now what I've tried to argue with the last uh, few slides, the fact that we do have to pay this due to a second law. There has to be dissipation. So your energy input has to be larger than you know, what you're using the energy for. We would, in principle, want to gravitate to like the largest persistent source of energy available to us, right? And that's pretty much the UV part of the spectrum of photons from the sun, right? Because those are kind of the highest energy sources that are constantly available to us, bombarding us all the time, and basically have the largest allowance, so the largest gap between that amount of energy and the energy then we're using for biological processes, right? Um, and this, in some sense, is then the thermodynamic argument for why a photon-based, a light-based origin of life is more plausible. Um, though again, it's not the final word. This is, not a, this is definitely not a closed book. Uh, lightning, uh, also a very high energy source, but I would argue probably too intermittent, unless somebody's willing to argue that like, the early uh, Earth atmosphere was, it was lightning all the time. Um, but photons certainly are, are there. Um, and the other part of the thing, which is actually kind of very exciting because the field has actually really blossomed in the last few years, there is now uh, developments in chemistry that support this, this notion. Um, so in particular, there's been work by, uh, by Jack Sostak at Harvard, and this is John Southern in Cambridge. Um, and what they were able to finally show in the last few years, this is a 2015 paper, is now there is a plausible chemistry that we can associate to making the basic elements of life. So lipids, which are the containers, right? The things that make up cell membranes. Amino acids, which are the bases of our proteins. Um, things like RNA, you know, nucleotides for genetic material. All of these can be synthesized under what we can, what the field considers plausible conditions, uh, uh, you know, similar to early, to, to early Earth. And critically, the catalyst here is ultraviolet light. So there seems to be, in some ways, this. Uh, um, 
you know, again, this is a plausibility argument. It's not a, it's not a definitive thing. But we can say, okay, UV light is then, thermodynamically speaking, the most attractive option for an origin of life. And now we have a plausible chemistry driven by UV light that can actually, you know, uh, lead to the synthesis of these, of these types of living materials. Um, again, is this the actual chemistry that occurred in earlier life? We cannot, we, we, will, we will probably never know that for certain, but it, it's, it, it does kind of, these are different pieces of the puzzle that we're, we're putting together. Okay, so kind of we're, we're coming towards the, uh, the end of the talk. So what I want to kind of uh, emphasize uh, at the end is again, you know, our, you know, we think of chemistry and all these other things like hurricanes to be like really two very, very different things. What I want to argue is that they're really truly connected to each other in this, in this deep mathematical way through uh, the notion of, of, of entropy, um, and that these are these are all these processes are all connected through non-equilibrium non thermodynamics, and it's kind of the line of argument that we try to I try to make tonight um, is something along the following. So, if you see a current, if you see this symmetry breaking where a certain sequence of events is more likely than the reverse, that necessarily implies there has to be some entropy increase in the universe, right? That entropy increase typically occurs through dissipation of heat into the environment. Okay, if heat isn't dissipated into the environment, uh, what does that mean? That means it requires a persistent power input, right? Uh, to, to, because you know, you're losing energy, so that, you have to, that energy has to be coming from, from something. And this is more or less what, what the, 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 the kind of conceptual framework, what it boils down to. What's interesting is this will apply just as well to exoplanets as it does to Earth, right? These are universal aspects of, of what we understand to be the laws of, of physics. And so any mechanism we think of life arising anywhere else still has to obey these basic you know, uh, thermodynamic ideas. Um, and I, just to kind of uh, wrap up, uh, this particular notion is kind of inter interwoven cascades of chemical cycles where you start with like a photon on top um, and then you know, dissipate energy throughout. Uh, while I was, I was discussing this in one of my classes and a colleague, Robin Snyder, who's a theoretical ecologist, um, she pointed out this beautiful, beautiful quote from Primo Levi, which summarizes this much, much better and more eloquently than, than I could. And this is from a short story of his called Carbon, which I, I highly recommend, just go Google it and read it. Um, and the way he described it is like this. Such is life, and inserting itself, a drawing off to its advantage, a parasitizing of the downward course of energy from its noble solar form to the degraded one of low temperature heat. In this downward course, which leads to equilibrium and thus death, life draws a bend and nests in it. And I think that beautifully kind of encapsulates, in some ways, the transient nature of all of this, right? Because remember, as you know, we're arguing here that entropy is increasing. All of this depends on this ent entropy increase. That can only go on for so long, right? So all these beautiful things that we see, all these beautiful patterns, these complicated structures, inherent in their physics is, of course, their transience and their eventual death through equilibrium. So in some ways, like you know, uh, you know, we're, you know, it's it's kind of a mixed blessing. We have all these beautiful things, but they won't last forever. Do you see ATP in viruses, in prions? Uh, so viruses basically are just kind of protein capsids uh, in incorporating uh, genetic material. So in order to actually copy themselves, they have to insert themselves into a host like a bacterium, for example, and they use the machinery, the metabolic machinery of the host to make the copy. Yeah. Not well, life. I mean, the virus in itself just sitting there uh, is not, you know, uh, you know, if there's no active biochemical cycle there, I wouldn't call that, that life. Once it's inserted there, it becomes a component of, of active biochemical cycles, and then in some sense it becomes a part of a living thing. So do you come down on the metabolism first versus uh, you know, a nucleic acid or, or um, a membrane? Yes, brain? so part of, okay, so again, this is uh, more kind of, you know, I'm, not a, I'm a physicist, not a chemist, but um, I think part of what, what, what this kind of work like that I showed here is arguing is in some sense the answer to the, you know, which came first, the chicken and the egg, is both. Um, that you can have a chemistry where all the various elements that you need can arise more or less simultaneously. And that in some sense seems plausible, the most plausible case because it's really hard to think of you know, containers containing nothing, you know, me, you know, things that need to be replicated like, like genetic material without the mechanisms, you know, the machinery to replicate them, right? So in some sense, you kind of would like as, you know, in some, as an Occam's razor kind of most simplest thing that somehow these all things more or less arose around the same time. Again, whether there could be more complicated mechanisms by which you have one thing existing before the other.
The Origin Science Scholars Lectures are presented by Case Western Reserve University's Institute for the Science of Origins, with the assistance of the Siegel Lifelong Learning Program, the College of Arts and Sciences, and Media Vision. For more information on the Origin Science Scholars Program, including a full video archive, please visit the Institute's website at origins.case.edu.